Okay, that was crazy. We're gonna, I'm starting the archive now, so I'm going to go back to the um, what you need to know. Know the body's first line of defense, those unbroken mucous membranes. The body's um, defenses, you'll need to know natural immunity and adaptive immunity, the difference between cellular and humoral, and what components are involved with those. You're going to have to know the active and passive immunity, active natural, active artificial, passive natural, passive artificial. Let me give you a question. Which of the following would be an example of passive natural immunity? And you'd have to choose um, placenta colostrum. From this slide, you probably have a good, I don't know, eight or ten questions. So make sure you're really familiar with all of those. Uh, hypersensitivity and aphylactic reactions, IgE, know that IgE is found in those hypersensitivity reactions. IgE is also um, involved with basophils that releases the histamine and heparin that gives you the itchy, sneezy feelings. Um, know that PAMPs are toll-like receptors, is, which is what pretty much makes your body recognize something as foreign. Know the definitions of all of these various components of the immune system. I was just searching through your exam um, earlier today. And there's quite a few questions on all of these. So if you're unsure on, it, on some of them, um, make sure that you know. So no, uh, lysozyme is found in tears and saliva. Interferon destroys virally infected cells. Antibodies, very important to know that they're secreted from B cells, especially plasma cells. And cytokines, the chemical um, receptors between, um, that cause things to communicate within the immune system. All right, a little bit more detail on the antigens and antibodies. Know what an antigen is. Um, know the epitope and antigenic determinant. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I do have a cough. Um, know the five classes and the important details about them. IgG, that one is in the greatest abundance and usually primarily involved in the secondary immune response. IgM is the largest. He's always involved in the primary immune response, plays a big role in that one. IgD, he's in the least concentration, um, less than 1% of all immunoglobulins are IgD, and those are usually found on the surface of B cells. IgE is involved in those hypersensitivity allergic type reactions, um, and IgA is found in the um, tears and such. Uh, know which region binds the antigen, the FAB region binds to the antigen, okay? Um, know that the antibody class and subclass are determined by the constant region of the heavy chain. That's important. I believe there's a test question asking you that. Know that there's many different bonds involved in an antibody. There's those van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonds. There's all kinds of bonds. Um, know the different phases of the antibody response. Leg, log, plateau, decline. Um, be able to draw, which obviously I won't make you draw on a multiple choice test, but know, be familiar with this picture that I have on here. So you know that um, the red area here would be the IgM and the blue area is the IgG. So IgG does come in um, much higher in the secondary response. Um, know what a titer is. <clears throat> the higher the titer, the more immune a person would be. If you had an antibody titer that was really high, that would mean that you are more immune to the disease that you have the antibody for. Um, what's so great about a monoclonal antibody, just as it sounds, it's cloned. So they're very all the same. With agglutination methods, um, precipitation and flocculation are very similar. Soluble antibody and soluble antigen creating a agglutination type reaction. A great example of um, flocculation is VDRL and RPR. VDRL is the syphilis test that we typically do on the spinal fluid, and the RPR, rapid plasma reagent, is the one that we typically do on the serum to test for syphilis. With agglutination, note that you can use a latex type of, um, or charcoal as a carrier for those antibodies. Hemagglutination <coughs> uses red blood cells. And then we can also do direct bacterial agglutination. An example of co-agglutination could be hemagglutination because we would use some type of a carrier to attach the antibody to. The definition of zeta potential, that's definitely on your test, the degree of repulsion between those cells. I have a little picture of a cell here. You can see the positive and negative charges around, around the cell. And the, those net negative charges are what keeps the cells from sticking together. You, if you didn't have those net negative charges, your cells that are traveling through your um, bloodstream would kind of get all sticky. 
but because they have the negative charges, they're able to float freely without running into each other. So in order to be able to overcome the zeta potential, um, there are some things that we can do. Centrifugum, use enzymes, colloids, or an anti-human globulin that you'll learn a lot more about in blood bank. Backing up to the two stages of agglutination, first stage sensitization, and then lattice formation, okay? You need to overcome the zeta potential for agglutination to occur. <coughs> now the definition of pseudoagglutination, that's false agglutination. It's typically caused by Rouleau. And what happens with Rouleau is there's some type of excess amount of protein floating around in the serum. And what that does is it kind of coats the cells and it overcomes those negative charges, so it causes those cells to stick together. Common causes of that would be uh, multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Those types of things have um, an abundance of abnormal proteins that can cause that to happen. Um, not so much on pregnancy testing um, on there. Agglutination inhibition, that is the test where if agglutination is present, then the test result is negative. All right, granulocytes and monocytes, you do need to know the development of the blood cells, yolk sac to the liver and spleen, then the bone marrow. Know the difference between the granulocytic cells. None of this is foreign to you guys because you've been in hematology for a couple quarters as well. Neutrophils are the ones that are capable of phagocytosis. They defend you against bacteria and fungus. Eosinophils regulate inflammation. Uh, they're also a defense against parasites. So if you have an allergic reaction, you may see some eosinophils increase. Also, if you have a parasitic type of infection. Basophils, those are involved in the hypersensitivity type reactions. They um, also have IgE involved with them. They release the histamine and heparin that make you all itchy and sneezy. Know the process of phagocytosis. Know the order. Can an elephant dig dirt? Chemotaxis, adherence, engulfment, digestion, destruction. Okay? You have to know that. What is normal flora? Normal flora is the bacteria that you have normally in your body that your body does not destroy as foreign. For example, your intestines, as you'll learn in microbiology, are just chock full of bacteria that you need for digestion. That's considered normal flora. You want to have that there for digestion to take place appropriately. Okay, the monocytes and macrophages. Uh, macrophage ingests foreign particles and um, infectious microorganisms by phagocytosis, just as the neutrophils do. He also induces an immune response and secretes biologically active molecules so that um, the body is familiar with those foreign items and can make antibodies against them. With acute inflammation, know that when inflammation does occur, diapedesis happens. As you can see, um, oh, that's not diapedesis in my picture. But when diapedesis happens, the cells are able to come out of the vessels and move through the, the tissues into the site of infection. Sepsis is what happens when the body has an overwhelming about a, amount of inflammation and infection within the body. So if someone's in sepsis or has septic shock, um, it's usually because of an overwhelming blood infection. All right, these are pretty important, the neutrophil and monocyte macrophage disorders. The neutrophil disorders, <clears throat> Shiria Kagashi is where there's an issue with giant granules and you have impaired chemotaxis. Um, for hematology, I think with that one too, you need to know that there's a lysosome um, defect with that. Chronic granulomatous disease, that is where there is an issue with the cascade of events required for hydrogen peroxide production. So how I remember this one is if you've ever, like I've done this, and this was horrible in college one time, I. I have, still have this bike. I had a truck bike that has the things that you slide your feet into so you can't get your feet out really easily. And I remember pulling into my driveway really, really fast, and it was a granular type driveway, which or gravel, which sounds like granular. And I turned the corner really fast. I couldn't get my feet out in time, so I totally wiped out on all this gravel. So I had all this granulomatous type of material stuck in my leg. So I went inside my roommates and I poured a bunch of hydrogen peroxide on it and it all bubbled up. So that's how I always memorized chronic granulomatous disease, is I had a bunch of granulomatous stuff stuck in my leg and I poured hydrogen peroxide on it. So I don't know if that helps you remember it. You can try and picture me wiping out the driveway. It was probably pretty funny if you were watching, but it was horrendously painful. Um, monocyte macrophage disorders, Gaucher's disease, 
has a deficiency of beta glucocerebrosidase. My students always put the G's together. Gauchers and glucocerebrosidase. Okay. Neiman pick disease, everybody always has an easy time memorizing that one because you pick your nose with your finger. Um, I don't know if that helps you, but that, I don't think I've ever had a student get that question wrong because they always laugh about that. Leukocyte adhesion disease, just as it sounds, the cells aren't as sticky as they should be, so um, they don't adhere and do the um, destroy infections like they should. Sorry, hold on. There we go. All right, these slides are going to start to look a little bit familiar. These are the same ones that I used for the um, exam two review. <laughs> we'll walk through it, and I'll let you know the importance of what you need to know. Know the primary lymphoid tissue in the mammals, the bone marrow in the fetal liver, and then the thymus, okay? Then the secondary lymphoid tissue, which is where those T cells and things go to hang out after they have a job, are lymph nodes, spleen, gut, bronchus, skin, thoracic duct, and the blood, okay? So when they're undifferentiated and they don't really know what the heck they're going to do in life, they're in the bone marrow, fetal liver, and the thymus. But then once they become stimulated and they have a role, then they are stored in the secondary lymphoid tissues, okay? Um, <clears throat> with our T lymphocytes, they have cluster designation antigens that promote cell-to-cell -cell interactions and adhesions. Um, so do the B cells, but the T cells are going to be a little bit different. They have um, transduction of signals that lead to lymphocyte activation, so they cause things to get rolling. Know the different subsets. The T helper cells are effectors and regulate antibody production. So go ahead and type in the bottom, T helper cells, is that CD4 or CD8? It is CD4. That one's easy to memorize because help has four letters, and it's CD4. Cytotoxic are able to directly destroy cells with viruses. And then we have the suppressor cells. The suppressors downregulate those T and B cells. So you need helper cells, but the helpers just can't help out all day long. You need somebody to tell them to slow down, okay? You can't keep helping forever. You have a T helper to T suppressor ratio of two to one. Um, that one's pretty easy to memorize because you want more helpers than you do suppressors, okay? So helper to suppressor is two to one. Now, with somebody with HIV, the helpers become destroyed, and you end up with more suppressors. So that ratio starts to flip-flop. When that ratio does flip-flop the opposite direction, we consider that HIV patient to have AIDS. And they end up getting sick from things that normally don't get us sick because of the increased amount of suppressors and the decreased amount of helpers. Um, don't worry about the bottom of this slide. Don't have to know that. Okay, natural killer and K-type cells. A couple questions on this. <clears throat> natural killer cells are able to destroy cells through an extracellular non-phagocytic me mechanism called cytotoxic reaction. So they just go in and bam, destroy these cells right off the bat. They don't have to be tagged with an antibody or anything. They just go in and destroy it because they know it's foreign. Super smart cells. On the other hand, the K-type cells are mononuclear cells that kill the cells sensitized with an antibody engaged by their FC receptors. So the difference between these, natural killer, just kills naturally. K-type needs an antibody attached to it. All right, the B lymphocytes. As you can see from my little picture here, we got a bunch of those little fried egg-looking plasma cells. The plasma cell kind of got cut off here. I can go ahead and, um, and type it. So this guy down here is a plasma cell. Actually, they all are. Um, they secrete antibodies. Know this. Okay? I remember quizzing my students on my campus saying, okay, what type of cell secretes antibodies? And they all start, stared at me. Like, okay, what type of cell secretes antibodies? They stared at me. It's a T cell. It's like, oh, B cells secrete antibodies. B cells that are secreting antibodies are called plasma cells. And I'll give you a, a, a giveaway here. It is on your hematology 2 test as well. Same question. It's going to be at both tests. So you might as well just get out of the way and know it, okay? B cells secrete antibodies. Antibodies secreting B cells are called plasma cells, okay? Um, they have a very uh, big role in the amnestic response or the secondary response as memory cells because they're able to come out and immediately just start secreting those antibodies that are needed to fight that infection. 
compliment, everybody's favorite. I'm surprised that the students on my campus actually enjoy compliment. Um, I think they're a little strange, but hey, if you like it, you like it. Um, compliment is synthesized in the liver, made out of 18 heat labile uh, proteins, and it's inactive in circulation until you have something start the whole process. You do have to know what activates each one. The classical pathway, an antibody antigen complex starts that one. Mandos binding lectin is uh, very similar, virally infected cells. And then the alternative pathway, which kind of got cut off here, is from the spontaneous cleavage of C3 when it comes in contact with those, um, with those cells. Um, you need to be able to answer all these questions. For a time saver, I'm not going to go over every single one. They are the same questions that you had to know for your week two exam. So go back and review those. I'll give one away to you, though. The one that's in the largest amount, C3. That's the best question. You're welcome. All right. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go through all these. are the same that you had for your other test. Um, you are going to have to know again. You're not going to have to type it in like you did last time. But elevated levels are found in glomerular nephritis, inflammatory conditions, trauma, and myocardial infarct. And they're decreased if someone has had complement recently activated. It's currently being consumed or is a genetic defect. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple more terms on here. I have a couple test questions on these as well. What are cytokines? Chemical messengers. What is interferon? Kills virally infected cells. Tumor necrosis factor plays a very large role in killing gram-negative bacteria, and interleukins are the communicators between the WBCs. All right, here's the fun part. Going on to immune response and infectious diseases. Um, <clears throat> how can a bacteria escape phagocytosis? Having some type of a capsule or a cell wall can help them evade that. Parasites can avoid being phagocytized because of mobility. Do you guys remember what type of white blood cell is usually increased with a parasitic infection? Go ahead and type it in. Yo. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. Um, what about if you had a bacterial infection? What type of cells might you see? And go ahead and think hematology on me here too. Most of you have to take that test as well. Neutrophils, specifically with a left shift, what type of cells might you see? in a leukemoid reaction being caused from bacterial infection. A lot of bands, right? Okay, fungal diseases, superficial versus systemic. What's the difference? Superficial means it's on the skin. Systemic means that it's traveled from the skin through the bloodstream. If you are immunosuppressed, someone who maybe can have cancer or an elderly person, those fungal diseases can become opportunistic, which means they'll take over the body. Usually these um, funguses, or fungal diseases have an antiphagocytic capsule, which makes it very difficult for them to be destroyed by phagocytosis. With these, um, you'll get into these a lot more in microbiology, so we don't do a whole lot with them here. But if you know that the osteoses are fungal diseases, you're doing well. Histoplasmosis, aspergillosis, coccidiomycosis, blastomycosis. My, mycosis. Um, well, cryptococcus isn't really an osis, but that one you'll just have to know. And spirotrichosis, okay? If you know that those are in the fungal category, um, you're doing well. Oh, no, it's not letting me flip slides here. What's going on? No, not that one. There we go. <clears throat> the next one is viral diseases. Um, know a little bit about that, or just know that they have a high replication rate. What they do is there's a picture of one right here. They plop themselves down on top of one of your white blood cells. They take that little spike sticking on the little butt there, and they push all of the, vi the DNA material that's up in that capsid gets pushed down into your WBC, where replication occurs. So all this viral replication is occurring inside of your white blood cells, and your body is just thinking, okay, that's just one of my white blood cells. I don't need to destroy that. It recognizes it itself. Well, after all those little baby viruses have replicated inside your white cell and pulled all the um, genetic material out of your cell to use it to make their own, 
there's a viral burst that happens, that cell bursts open, and uh, there's tons of baby viruses that move on to infect the next white cell. So viruses are so hard to destroy because they replicate inside your own cells. Know the difference between rickettsial and mycoplasmal? Know that rickettsia is close to a virus. Mycoplasma is similar to a bacteria. Herpes viruses, um, that is a DNA virus that replicates within a cell's nucleus, just like the other viruses. Um, know that varicella zoster is the same as chickenpox. Um, not so much in herpes 6. Uh, torch profile. Know what's involved with this. Toxoplasma, other virus, rubella, CMV, and herpes. Okay? Know that. Know those. So why an acute constant specimen? Acute is uh, something that's drawn right away, so you'd have a really high amount of IgM if you're currently sick. Convalescent specimen is drawn two to three weeks later, and in that case, they're hoping that you have a high amount of IgG, that your body has converted over to um, increase the amount of, um, of IgG to help prevent that infection from occurring again in the future. Okay, vaccines. Um, what you need to know about vaccines, that uh, there's been a significant reduction in vaccine-preventable diseases um, back so, or since they've started vaccines. They can be live or attenuated. They can be a toxoid, such as tetanus. That's why it hurts so bad when you get that um, tetanus shot. They actually get that tetanus toxin, and it causes a tetanus type of situation in that area of your muscle, which makes it really achy and painful. Can you imagine having that in your whole body? Uh, there's also non-replicating vaccines, which are just uh, a protein that they're injecting you with. <clears throat> In order to be, a vac be given as a vaccine, it has to produce protective active immunity with only minimal side effects according to the FDA. So it has to pass um, those standards within the FDA. It also has to have a stable shelf life and have enough potency that um, remains while it's on that shelf. We talked about titer a little bit earlier. The actual definition is the reciprocal of the highest dilution at which an antibody can still be detected. A person with a titer of, this is backwards, of one to two is actually less immune than someone with a um, two to four, or one to four. So here, we'll cross that off. Less immune. We just talked about the acute and convalescent, so we don't need to go over that again. Strep infections. <clears throat> no, it's a gram-positive cocci caused by strep pyogenes. If it lacks the M antigen, it lacks virulence, which means it's nasty. So if it has the M protein, that's what makes it nasty or virulent. No, the streptolysin O is responsible for making a hole in the cell membrane, which is easy to memorize because the O looks like a hole. Streptolysin S is what makes the hemolysis pattern that you see in the, the blood agar plate over to your right. See those big um, yellow circles around the bacterial colonies? That is the streptolysin S lysing those red blood cells. Know that hyaluronidase is a spreading factor. Hyaluronidase sounds like mayonnaise. DNases degrade DNA. Streptokinase dissolves clots. And erythrogenic toxin causes that scarlet rash type fever. Um, the production, I'm going down to part um, L here. There's a production of anti-streptolysin O antibodies with some, with some strep infections. Okay, so that's a way that we can detect if someone has had a recent strep infection. Not done very often. Sometimes they do it to look for rheumatic fever and things like that. If they're coming up negative on a um, throat culture and they want to see if they've been making antibodies to it and developed a further in infection, they might look for ASO antibodies. The other one down here, um, group B strep, I'm going to skip down to. What causes it is the bacteria called strep agalactiae. It can cause meningitis in newborns. And that kind of got cut off, but you should have that in your notes. The next one, syphilis. No, it's caused by treponema pallidum. It's a spirochete. It looks like a spiral um, type of noodle, which is what you see on the top right-hand side. That's what a spirochete would look like if you could see it under the microscope. Very difficult to isolate and grow. Um, so therefore, it, we don't actually see them under the microscope very often at all. 
easy to treat with penicillin, which is why we don't see it very often anymore. Know the signs and symptoms. The first primary sign happens within three months. They get a shaker on their genitalia, as you can see from the first picture. Secondary, the primary shaker goes away two to eight weeks later. Like, well, I'm not going to the doctor or whatever it was. must be nothing because it went away. Well, then they all of a sudden get skin lesions, like you can see on that guy's hand. They'll think that they cut their hand and they have an infection on a, um, a, a cut. So they may not think anything of it because after a few weeks, you know what, that's going to go away too. Well, three to ten years later, they start to go a little bit crazy. Um, they can have lesions on their face and their central nervous system is affected. So it ends up causing issues that way too. It can be transmitted by the placenta, which is why they test pregnant moms for it. I know the two different types of tests, the VDRL, usually in spinal fluid, RPR, usually done on serum. And if you do have a positive test for a VDRL or an RPR, they do a confirmation test called an um, FTA-ABS, and it's a fl fluorescent troponemal antibody test. And under the microscope, those little spirochetes would be all lime green like you can see in the bottom here. Tick-borne diseases. Lyme disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. I have a lime green Ferrari because of Ferrari, um, burgdorferi sounds like Ferrari at the end. So Borrelia burgdorferi transmitted by exodid ticks, and it causes this erythema migrans rash that you see in this um, this picture over here. It looks like a bullseye. Usually in the first stage, you end up with a rash, and you get flu-like symptoms. So usually where we see um, some issues with this, people like hunters, avid hunters, dogs um, are a big one. How hard do you think it is to see that erythema migrans rash on your dog? You can't. They've got too much fur. Also think of a very hairy ma male with hairy legs or hairy arms who may have this rash underneath and they can't really see it. Um, so from there you get like flu-like symptoms, but that'll go away after four or five weeks. But the problem is within... Um, weeks to years later, you end up with arthritis. It kind of settles in your joints, and uh, it, it becomes very painful and difficult to do things like work um, a typical job. So that's why um, they, they really tell you to be careful with the, with the ticks. Um, the prevention, do a tick check and tuck your pants in your socks. I said that's kind of funny. All right, the next one, ehrlichiosis. That one um, is an intra-WBC inclusion. So if you see the WBCs to the picture in the right there, those dark inclusions there is the Ehrlichia. So that one you should know from hematology as well. Babesiosis, which you've also learned about in hematology, transmitted by the Iscapularis tick. Um, with this, uh, it can be treated just as the Ehrlichia can too, but usually they have kind of flu-like symptoms and a hemolytic anemia going on. But know that Babesiosis is an intraerythrocytic organism. Got that? Erythro, or intra erythrocytic organism. And they've got that little cross pattern there. Taxoplasmosis, these are little crescent shaped guys that we find in blood smears. This is why pregnant women should not change kitty litter. Okay? It can cross the placenta and be devastating to the fetus. It can have really nasty effects. Okay, that's all you need to know about that one. On to my next one here. Next one, cytomegalovirus. Uh, this is a member of the herpes family, and it can sp spread from cell to cell, and it circulates in the lymph nodes. Usually it's spread through oral, respiratory, or venereal type of routes. Um, it's a major cause of death in AIDS patients. Okay, So that's, that's a big problem with them. Usually it doesn't cause a lot of problem with us but it can cause um, pretty major infections in AIDS patients or in cancer patients that have um, some type of immunocompromised situation going on. It's a, most, it's a very common intrauterine infection. Um, it can cross the placenta and cause mental retardation. All right, mono or Epstein-Barr virus can lead to Burkitt's lymphoma. You can see the picture of this boy up in the top right-hand corner there where a tumor has started to grow through his lymph nodes um, and actually disfigure his face. And that's something we see a whole lot um, in the United States. While people do get Burkitt's lymphoma, it's usually treated well before it gets to a point of what you see this poor little fellow with here. It can also cause infectious mononucleosis, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, 
and other types of neoplasms or tumors of the thymus, parotid gland, and larynx, which is kind of what you see with this child over here. It is a member of the herpes family. It's transmitted by close um, contact. They used to call it the kissing disease when I was little. Um, with this, I have heterophile antibodies listed here. Um, we see problems sometimes, heterophile antibodies interfering with other tests more so than anything. But heterophile antibodies are uh, stimulated by one antigen and react with an entirely unrelated um, antigen. So when we do a mono test, we need to get rid of the heterophile antibodies before we do the actual testing. So our test kits now are capable of avoiding those. But back in the olden days, um, we used to have to do multiple steps to get rid of those interfering heterophile antibodies before we could do the, the testing itself. Come on, slides, switch. There we go. Sorry. All right, AIDS. Um, AIDS is part of the retroviridae family. It converts viral RNA into DNA and reverses the normal process of tr tr transcription, which is why it's called a retrovirus. Know that HIV glycoprotein 120 binds to the T cell CD4, and HIV 1 and HIV 2 are two types of HIV. Um, one isn't any better or worse to have than the other. Um, it's the fourth ma major cause of death in the world. Um, it's held in leukocytes, just like all other viruses are. You can see in this picture here that the um, virus is inserted into the white cell and it uses the DNA from inside of your white cells, converts it, and changes it into their DNA. So it uses all those um, nucleic acids and things to make its own DNA and replicate itself. Um, when somebody does have AIDS, they do end up getting opportunistic infections. Things that don't usually get us sick get them very sick. Pneumocystis carini is a really popular one. Cytomegalovirus, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, herpes, legionella, and histoplasmosis are very common things that um, AIDS patients do get very ill from. We do see that they have Kaposi sarcoma lesions. If you've ever seen the movie Philadelphia with Tom Hanks, he had all those brown lesions all over. They're kind of a, a cancerous type lesion that they get towards the end of the AIDS uh, cycle. Over time, we see a very sharp decrease in an AIDS patient's T cells. The T helper cells, CD4s, are destroyed, and then the T suppressors become elevated, so it suppresses the immune system even more. In order to treat these patients, we give them highly active antiretroviral therapy. Some types of medications, it's usually a very expensive cocktail of pills that they have to take to try and extend their life. And usually what it does is it just... Um, it's a transcriptase inhibitor, so it just slows down the amount of time it takes to convert from HIV to AIDS. So it may add about 10 years onto their life, but it cannot be treated completely. Uh, for testing, we look for the HIV P24 antigen. You have to know that. And we do a Western blot test to confirm the disease. All right, hepatitis is our next section. You see the guy here with the... Um, the yellow around the eyes, or the jaundice eyes there. Um, there's a couple types. There's acute, which is, and then there's also fulminant acute, which is rare with hepatic failure. We can have subacute hepatitis without jaundice, which is where there's antibodies in the serum, but they don't have any symptoms of it. Then we can have chronic hepatitis. This is where they have inflammation and necrosis for six months or more. Okay, let's go over each of the different types of hepatitis. There are several questions on this. Hepatitis A, usually fecal oral. Hepatitis B, it's the only DNA virus. Um, that one is through blood and body fluids, but not stool. You need to be familiar with the antigens and antibodies with this one. With hepatitis B, the antigens, the hepatitis B surface antigen, that would be very high when you're actively sick. The hepatitis B E antigen means there's, you have a high degree of infectivity. There's a lot of replication going on. The antibodies, hepatitis um, B core antibody, means you've had a recent hepatitis B infection. And the hepatitis B antibody develops when you're starting to recover from the actual infection. Hepatitis C is usually blood or um, 
IV drug use usually. Hepatitis D, you have to have B to get. Hepatitis E is fecal oral, just as A is. And hepatitis G is closely related to C. Um, usually bloodborne, sometimes blood transfusions and things like that can cause that one. All right, not letting me switch slides again. There we go. Hypersensitivity reactions. I had the pure luck video in my course announcement to kind of show you a really stupid example of a bee sting. Um, obviously, people don't blow up quite like that, but they can um, start to get their their throat start to close and things like that if they don't have access to some type of an EpiPen. So know the definition of a hypersensitivity reaction. It's the immediate or delayed, normal but exaggerated, or uncontrolled immune response to an antigen that produces inflammation, cell destruction, or tissue injury. Um, an allergy is also known as an atopy. IgE is usually involved. Remember that gets the IgE gets the basal cells involved, which that causes the degranulation and the release of the histamines and heparin. Um, a couple different things can cause it. Um, hay fever, um, food, and latex are the most common. But you do have to know the types, the definition of that type, and, and what the examples are. So example would be type 1 is anaphylactic, things like hay fever, asthma, uh, bee stings, foods. Type 2 is cytotoxic, antibody dependent, things like hemolytic disease of the newborn, transfusion reactions. Type three is the immune complex diseases, such as lupus and farmer's lung. Type four is cell mediated, and this includes things like a TB skin test, a latex allergies, or any other type of contact dermatitis. Okay, that's what you have to know with those. Rubella, know that this is also known as a German measles. It um, can cause, uh, it's, it's also trans, can be transmitted through the placenta and cause severe um, issues with the baby. That's pretty much all you have to know with that. Autoimmune and lupus. Know um, what autoimmunity means. It's an undesirable consequence of uh, the immune system if it gets out of hand. Organ-specific diseases include things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis um, or type 1 diabetes. That can be um, organ-specific because you have the autoimmune antibodies to those um, beta cells in the islets of Langerhans. <coughs> Some other types of mid-spectrum disorders that aren't to an organ would be idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura and multiple sclerosis. Some factors that influence autoimmunity um, age, genetics, UV radiation, um, immunopathic mechanisms that happen is immune complexes are formed, and that's what causes most of the organ damage. And you have complement and cytotoxic T cells involved. Um, one way that we screen for a majority of these connective tissue disorders or the lupus type disorders is to do an anti-nuclear antigen test or an ANA test. It's positive in 99% of lupus patients, but it doesn't just detect lupus. If you're positive for an ANA, so they will then go on and test you for the other antibodies to find out specifically what type of anti-nuclear antigen you have. If it's not lupus, it could be rheumatoid factor, could be Sjogren's disease, could be scleroderma. It could be a number of things, not just lupus. So ANA is just a screening test. Okay, the first one is um, <clears throat> is lupus. You can see the characteristic butterfly rash um, that you see on this lady's face here. Um, usually, uh, well, there's a couple different kinds. Discoid is just a rash, and that's 10% of cases. Well, oftentimes, it can be drug-induced. Other forms, mixed connective tissues, 10%, but systemic is the majority at 70% of people where it affects the skin, joints, lungs, kidney, and heart. It's idiopathic, which means that we really don't know what causes it, but we do know that there's a defect in the regulation of the immune system. Um, fall more often in women, worsens during pregnancy. 
Um, it can be caused by procainamides and anticonvulsants, which when you take those drugs away, then the symptoms usually um, go away. Um, the cause of death is usually renal failure or some type of infection complications. Uh, be familiar with that butterfly rash that you see up top. Um, know that they're positive for the ANA um, anti-nuclear antibody test. And it's specifically the Smith antigen, okay? So if it helps you to memorize me somehow um, with this, I have it really tiny down here. I'll try and highlight it. Oh, I just crossed it out. Let's try that again. Okay, so if you have um, lupus, specifically the Smith antigen would be positive. So the ANA would be positive. If you did the Smith, the Smith would also be positive. If the ANA was positive, you did the Smith, the Smith is negative, then it's not lupus. Okay, we have some of the ANA patterns here. If you have a homogenous ANA pattern, it could mean that you have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. So if they did the ANA and they saw this pattern and reported it, they would then go continue on to do a rheumatoid arthritis test and a Smith antibody. If they have a peripheral pattern, it could be lupus or Sjogren's. So what they would do is look for the antibodies for Smith or for the Sjogren's antibodies. If you have speckled, um, it could be lupus or Sjogren's as well. If you have a nuclear pattern, it could be scleroderma, Sjogren's, or lupus. Okay, so you'd have to check for the antibodies in those. Anticentromere usually is found in scleroderma. So if they see that pattern, um, the Crest syndrome, which is calcification, respiratory issues, the whole list of things that Crest stands for, um, they would lean towards scleroderma and do some confirmation tests for that. Okay, looking at the immunoproliferative disorders. This is what happens when a B cell gets a mind of its own, okay? So normally a B cell secretes uh, a certain type of um, antibody that it's been trained to. But other times they end up getting a mind of their own and secrete large amounts of a single type of immunoglobulin that's abnormal. Multiple myeloma is when there's um, multiple types of a protein being discharged from these B cells. The cause is unknown, usually die in one to three years. Um, it's a very poor prognosis if you've got a high beta-2 microglobulin. Um, symptoms are weakness, anemia, bone pain, hepatosplenomegaly. We see RULO on the smears. We see Bentz-Jones protein in the urine. And there's a tall, sharp peak in the M region of their electrophoresis test. So this top picture here, let's see if I can change colors with my circling tool. Um, this serum protein electrophoresis, that big red um, spike at the end is not normal. You can see from the picture just below it, normally there should not be a giant spike like that at the end. Okay, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. This is where there's large amounts of, the, um, of a certain type of immunoglobulin. Don't have to know that it's the 1,9-S IgM type. It's not as frequent as multiple myeloma. You live a little bit longer. And there's similar symptoms of multiple myeloma with Raynaud's phenomenon, which is where your hands have an intolerance to being cold. We have uncontrolled proliferation of those B cell lymphocytes, a heavy accumulation of IgM in the plasma and bone marrow. We also have RULO with this one as well. So those are monoclonal type of issues. Know that a polyclonal gemopathy is not cancerous like the monoclonals that you see up here, the multiple myeloma and the Waldenstrom's. Polyclonal is where you have more than one type of immunoglobulin being secreted. And it's usually not malignant, but it's caused, um, it's a secondary to another disease. Okay, so another disease is causing um, that to happen. Renal failure, I think, is, is an example of one. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, usually more males than females have this, and it begins in the mid-30s to the, to the early 50s. Shortened lifespan, um, usually the frequent cause of death is cardiovascular disease with this. The three stages, first you have synovitis where your hands start to get sore um, and your joints really hurt. Then you have events that perpetuate into an inflammatory type of reaction within your body. Those inflammatory reactions in the synovium then cause a prolif prolif proliferative destruction 
process of all the tissues in your body. So it's kind of a slow and painful type of issue. Um, usually they've got fatigue, anorexia, they don't feel like eating, they're weak and very achy and stiff. Um, let's see. We do find elevated um, erythrocyte sedimentation rates with these as well. Two other types, Felty syndrome and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Felty syndrome is rheumatoid arthritis with uh, leukopenia and splenomegaly, and juvenile is having it um, before 16 years of age. Getting close to the end here, guys, I promise. Last couple chapters here, organ transplantation and bone marrow. Okay, organ transplantation. <clears throat> um, the major histocompatibility codes for the human leukocyte antigens, which are the molecular basis for T-cell discrimination of self from non-self. So we have to get as close of a match as possible with the major histocompatibility codes to make sure that rejection is minimal. It's almost impossible unless you have an identical twin um, to get uh, organ from. It's almost impossible to avoid rejection completely, but the closer match you are with those things, the less likely it is to happen. So we do the HLA, HLA typing on those and try to get a close match. The HLA B27, um, it's kind of an extra piece thrown in here, is related to ankylosing spondylitis with writer's arthritis. So I just kind of threw that in there. It's important to know. Know the transplant terminologies, the differences. Autograft, syngraft, allograft, and xenograft. Auto, same person. For example, um, someone's got a lot of burns on their face. They'll take skin off their buttocks or thigh and put it on their face. Um, syngraft is a kidney between monozygotic twins, so that will be a perfect match. Then there's an allograft or a homograft, which is human to human. So it'll be like um, Amy giving me her kidney or me giving Amy a kidney. Xenograft would be like an animal to a human, like a pig heart to a human. Um, Anti-rejection drugs are often given. So cyclosporin, uh, we talked about those in chemistry. Those are immunosuppressive drugs that help stop that uh, rejection from happening. We give them steroids, which inhibit um, the antigen-driven T cell proliferation. We can give them um, tacrolimus, which is 100 times more powerful than cyclosporin, and sirolimus as well as an, for an anti-rejection drug. Uh, we have to be careful of graft versus host disease. So let's say I get Amy's kidney. Okay, Her kidney does have T cells in it that are going to destroy some of my tissues. So you have to be careful of that as well. We do have some markers for rejection. Um, the messenger RNA and the FOXP3 messenger RNA are some tests that we can do to look for renal rejection. Bone marrow transplantation. So what they do with these patients <coughs> is they give them a ton of chemotherapy if they've got some type of leukemia to kill off all of their uh, stem cells and WBCs. Then what they do is they take the bone marrow from a donor, inject it into the bloodstream of the cancer patient in hopes that those stem cells from the donor make their way into the bone marrow and start growing a new healthy set of cells. Okay, Cancers that we treat with this are leukemia and non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, we really want to get those stem cells in there, which are the CD34 positive. Different types of transplants, allogenic, peripheral blood stem cells from a related or unrelated HLA match, syngeneic from an identical twin, autologous is getting your own. So let's say um, if any of you, when you were pregnant, I know they always ask, or I got a lot of stuff in the mail on this, that you could bank your baby's cord blood. Okay, If you do that, there's stem cells in there. So if they end up getting leukemia when they're ages six or seven, they can give them um, chemotherapy and give them their own stem cells back and have a perfect match. Okay, last one I lied, there's one more, tumors. Um, oncology is a study of cancer and tumors. They can be benign or malignant, benign meaning they're not cancerous, malignant meaning there are. Um, we have a couple different stages of cancer, initiation, promotion, and progression. No apoptosis is the general dying of cells over time. The definition of proto-oncogenes and oncogenes. Then there's also viral oncogenes, Epstein-Barr virus and human papillomavirus. 
Epstein-Barr virus causes that Burkitt's lymphoma. Human papillomavirus can cause cervical cancer. Um, some of the different ways that the body can defend against cancer are T lymphocytes, natural killer cells, macrophages, and antibodies. And there's different types of treatments that we have down here too. Um, and I have you ever heard of a teratoma? <laughs> the teratoma um, is a, can a tumor filled with hair and teeth. Um, it's kind of creepy when they remove those from people's abdomens and such. All right, let's see here. Got some poll questions coming at you. Oops, sorry about that. You don't need that. All right. Which of the following cells produce antibodies? Oh, no. There you go. I apologize, my computer's going a little slow here. There we have it. B cells and plasma cells are the correct answer. Remember that I told you that's going to be on your hematology test, too. You're welcome. I gave you that answer for two tests. <coughs> what is the antigen binding portion of the antibody? Ooh, 50-50, the variable region of the heavy and light chains. So that's the third one down. What is serum factor that is formed in response to foreign substances? Antibody is the correct answer. T cells are capable of doing what? They are capable of antigen presenting. Um, they are not capable of phagocytosis, and they are not capable of making immunoglobulins. What type of cells make immunoglobulins? Type it in the, ta the text chat. What plasma B cells, correct. What type of cells are capable of phagocytosis? Right, a macrophages too. Here's another little uh, clue for you guys that I'll type down here that you need to know. Um, memory cells are long-lived um, B cells that have been stimulated by an antigen.
Okay. So um, plasma cells do secrete antibodies, but they're called memory cells when they're long-lived and they've been um, stimulated by an antigen. So know that too. Circulating complement proteins are in the form of what? Cytokines, lysozymes, proenzymes, or epitopes? It's a tough one. The answer for this one is actually proenzymes. It's not something that we talked about a lot, but complement proteins are actually enzymes, proenzymes. All right. Which is the last complement component that ends in red blood cell lysis? Yep, nine is the correct answer. That five, six, seven, eight, nine MAC attack ends up with the uh, red cell lysis. Cytokines are capable of doing what? The answer is all the above. They do chemotaxis, cell migration, and fever as well. So sometimes people don't think about the cell migration and fever, but they do um, play a role in those as well. <coughs> Sorry, guys. I have a cough that just will not go away. A substance is most antigenic when its biochemical composition is made up of what? Protein is the correct answer. The more protein it has, the better an antigen it will be. Prozone phenomenon occurs when?
This one is when the antibody is in excess. <clears throat> Elizabeth on the St. Cloud campus has a good way of memorizing this one. Um, pros, when you think of pro football players, have nice bodies. So antibody is in excess when you've got pro zone. So if that helps you memorize that one, um, go for it. Where would you find undifferentiated lymphocytes? Bone marrow, thymus, spleen, or lymph nodes? Okay, good. Everybody put bone marrow. They're in the bone marrow until they get a job. Then they'll move on to um, more of the other areas. Okay, but the first place they will be is the bone marrow. What is the term for the negative charge on cells that keeps the red cells from agglutinating in the bloodstream? Zeta potential is correct. You guys are smart. Which antibody is best at agglutination and complement fixation? And the answer to this one is IgM because he's large. Because he's so big, he agglutinates well and complement, um, fix complement really well. So it's IgM. Which disease would you expect with a speckled ANA pattern throughout the nucleus and a positive test for anti-Smith? This is correct. Lattice formation is caused by cross links between what? Antigens and antibodies is the correct answer for that. Serology is the study of what?
there's antibodies. Good job. The fundamental principle of immunology is the recognition of what? Self is the correct answer. Humoral mediated immunity is associated with which of the following? Think about what is part of humoral immunity. All right, I'm trying to get it up there. Come on. There we go. <coughs> humoral immunity is associated with B lymphocytes. Humoral immunity refers to antibodies, okay? B lymphocytes create antibodies. Oh, no. Bone marrow transplantation in immunocompromised patients presents which of the following major problems? Leukemia, hypersensitivity, graft-versus-host disease, or death? Graft versus host disease is the correct answer. But yeah, death would be a problem too. <laughs> but graft versus host disease is what we're looking for. <clears throat> the binding of complement components by antigen antibody complexes is known as what? This one's tough. We didn't talk about this one a whole lot. Complement fixation is the correct answer for that. Patients with severely reduced C3 levels tend to have what? Increased bacterial infections is the correct answer. Hemolytic anemia would have more increased levels of C3. The role of a macrophage during an antibody response is to do what?
The answer is to process the antigen and present it. The third one down there. <coughs> Antibody expression in the development for autoimmune disease is one of the major problems of autoimmunities, actually. Circulating immune complexes is the correct answer. Which mediator is responsible for the wheel and flare? Histamine is the correct answer. The itchy, itchy sneeziness. <clears throat> the portion of the antigen that binds to an antibody or T cell receptor is called what? Epitope is the correct answer. When inflammation and infection overwhelm the body, what is it called? So this is an S. Sepsis is the correct answer. Which of the following is sometimes used as a tumor marker? Alpha fetoprotein, hepatitis B surface antigen, biotin, or CD1? Think back to your chemistry days with this one. Alpha fetoprotein is correct. Hepatocellular carcinoma, actually. In Bruton's disease, measurements of serum immunoglobulins would show what?
This one is the absence of all immunoglobulins. People with Bruton's A, A gamma globulinemia, they have no immunoglobulins at all. Obviously, they, they don't live very long. These cells are responsible for inhibiting the action of other T cells. Suppressor is correct. Which of the following is responsible for the beta hemolysis on a blood auger plate? Streptolysin S is the correct answer. Hyaluronidase would be the spreading factor, but streptolysin S is the hemolysis. What are long-lived T cells that have been stimulated by an antigen? Boy, if you look at the text box, it really gives this one away. Memory cells is the correct answer. The propensity or attraction of a bond between antigen and antibody is termed what? The strength of attraction. is correct. Blank are cytokines that regulate chemotaxis. Chemokines is correct. What is the genetic target of carcinogens? Oncogenes is the correct answer. Oh, five more here, guys. What is the causative agent of Lyme's disease?
Borrelia burgdorferi is correct. The actual strength of a bond between antigen and antibody is? Avidity is correct. Which of the following tests is an acute phase reactant that could be elevated in post-operative patients? CRP is correct, that's generalized inflammation. Macrophage phagocytosis of bacteria is enhanced by which of the following? Opsinin is the correct answer. I feel like opsinization. After taking a medication, a patient develops respiratory distress, vomiting, and hives. What is this reaction mediated by? IgE is correct. Which of the following can cause sore throat, fatigue, lymphadenopathy, and liver inflammation? Reactive lymphs are usually noted. Those reactive lymphs are given it away. Oh, we lost Tony. Epstein Barr virus, yep, causes mono. Last one. If a titer is performed and agglutination is present in the 1 to 64 tube but negative into the 1 to 32 tube, how do you report this titer? Sixty four is correct. Actually, this is kind of backwards. 
Yeah, this is this is a really backwards question. I'm surprised you guys aren't yelling at me. It would never be agglutination wouldn't be present in a higher one than the lower one. So if it's positive in the 32 and negative in the 64, the answer would be 32. So I have this kind of flip flopped. Just know that the highest tube with a positive reaction is your answer. Okay, this is really a backwards question. All right, that is it for my review session. We went five minutes or not. Do you guys have any questions? I know everybody always asks this 100 multiple choice question. You are welcome. There was um, some really stupid questions, and I'm going in and changing them right now. So nobody's going to go take that exam right now, are they? <laughs> Good. Because if you do, you're going to come across some really stupid questions. Oh, you're very welcome, guys. I'll miss all of you. I really will. Okay, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to stop the archive and get this posted in your class so you can go watch it again.